world's largest it's a recession. Real risk. A trade deal cannot be agreed with the UK. About the danger of climate change. In a... Welcome to this very special online event that we're hosting to commemorate the 125th birthday of the London School of Economics and Political Science. My name is Minu Shafiq and I'm the director of LSE. The LSE was founded by a community of Fabians who believed that the combination of education and evidence could change the world for the better. They started with just a few rooms on the Strand here in London and a handful of part-time teachers, but they had global ambitions from the start, with students from all over the world, admitting women from the beginning and fostering a radical vision of a more just society. 125 years later, here we are having produced 150,000 graduates around the world, 18 Nobel laureates, over 50 heads of state, and we're ranked the top social science institution in Europe. Our strategy is called Shape the World. And I'm so delighted to welcome Kristalina Georgieva here today, since she embodies so much of what the school represents. Born in Bulgaria, she earned a PhD and worked as an associate professor at the University of National and World Economy in Sofia. She came to the LSE as a visiting fellow, which you will see here in this photograph, in the late 1980s, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and had her first exposure to capitalist economics, including, I believe, opening her first bank account on the corner of Houghton Street here on the LSE campus. As you can see from the photo, she hasn't changed very much since then, but she has certainly accomplished a lot. She joined the World Bank soon after the LSE, where we were colleagues for many years, and she greatly shaped the bank's first thinking around environmental issues. She then went on to be European Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid, and Crisis Response, where again, I had the pleasure of working together with her when I was the Permanent Secretary at the Department for International Development. She returned to the World Bank as CEO in 2017 and was selected Managing Director of the IMF in September 2019. Kristalina joined the fund when the world is facing the biggest crisis our generation has ever seen. A global pandemic, the largest economic contraction in history, and debt levels already higher than humanity has ever seen as we attempt to recover. The IMF and its outstanding staff have responded at an unprecedented scale with financial support programs in over 80 countries delivered at extraordinary speed while working from home. But we are still in the fog of war. When I worked at the IMF, the speech Kristalina will give today was traditionally called the curtain raiser. It was when the managing director revealed how the fund saw the world before all the world's finance ministers and central bank governors assembled in Washington for the annual meetings. Now today's curtain raiser has special resonance given the moment in history in which we find ourselves. The people running the world economy are not about to board planes to get to Washington, but I suspect they will be listening more intently than ever to try and see through the fog, to better understand the challenges that we collectively face and having served in the trenches with Kristalina and the staff at the IMF, I can think of no one better to raise the curtain and tell us what lies ahead. I'm also pleased to welcome Sarah Eisen here, who will moderate our discussion following Kristalina's remarks. Sarah is co-anchor of CNBC's Closing Bell, where she brings her expertise of financial markets and the global economy to an appreciative audience. So over to you, Kristalina. Thank you, Minus, for the warm welcome. It is such an honor to celebrate with all of you the 125th anniversary of the London School of Economics, a proud moment for the students and faculty and for the alumni. As an alumna of LSE and as managing director of the IMF, I know that our institutions share so many 
of the same values. And I was reminded of that last year when I saw a large new sculpture, the globe, on the LSE campus. We are connected by our global perspective, by caring deeply about the world we live in and about its future. Mark Wallinger's sculpture could not symbolize any better what we are facing today. Our world is turned upside down by the pandemic, by the loss of more than a million lives, by the economic impact on billions of people. In low income countries, the shocks are so profound that we face the risk of a lost generation. To confront this crisis, we can take inspiration from a previous generation. William Beveridge, a former LSE director, issued his famous report in 1942, which led to the creation of the UK's National Health Service. And in 1944, John Maynard Keynes and Harry Dexter White led the establishment of the Bretton Woods system, including the IMF, my institution, and the World Bank. They forged a better world in the worst possible moment, in the midst of a war. We need the same spirit now for the post-pandemic world, to build one that is more inclusive and more resilient. And this will be the focus of the IMF's 189 member countries when we meet in our virtual annual meetings next week. And it is what I will concentrate on today. First, let's look at the economic picture. Global economic activity took an unprecedented fall in the second quarter of this year when about 85% of the world economy was in lockdown for several weeks. The IMF in June projected a severe global GDP contraction in 2020. The picture today is less dire. We now estimate that the second quarter downturn was somewhat less severe than expected allowing for a small upward revision in our global forecast for 2020. And we will continue to project for 2021 a painful and uneven recovery. You will see these projections next week. We have reached this point largely because of extraordinary policy measures they put the floor under the world economy. Governments have provided around $12 trillion in fiscal support to households and firms. And unprecedented monetary policy actions have maintained the flow of credit, helping millions of firms to stay in business. But some were able to do more than others. For advanced economies, it is whatever it takes. For poorer countries, they strive for whatever is possible. This gap in response capacity is one reason why we see differentiated outcomes. Another reason is the effectiveness of measures to contain the pandemic and restart economic activities. For many advanced economies, including the United States and Euro area, the downturn remains extremely painful, but it is less severe than expected. And China is experiencing a faster than expected recovery. Others are still hurting badly, and some of our revisions are on the downside. Emerging markets and low income and fragile states continue to face a precarious situation they have weaker health system. They are highly exposed to the most affected sectors, such as tourism and commodity exports. And they are highly dependent on external financing. Yes, abundant liquidity and low interest rates helped many emerging markets to regain access to borrowing. 
but not a single country in sub-Saharan Africa has issued external debt since March. So my key message is this. The global economy is coming back from the debt of the crisis, but this calamity is far from over. All countries are now facing what I would call the long ascent, a difficult climb that will be long, uneven, and uncertain, and prone to setbacks. As we embark on this ascent, we are all joined by a single rope, and we are only as strong as the weakest climbers. They will need help on the way up. The path ahead is clouded with extraordinary uncertainty. Faster progress on health measures, such as vaccines and therapies, could speed up the ascent. But it could also get worse, especially if there is a significant increase in severe outbreaks. Risk remain high, including from rising bankruptcies and sketched valuations in financial markets. And many countries have become more vulnerable. Their debt levels have increased because of their fiscal response to the crisis and the heavy output and revenue losses. We estimate that global public debt will reach a record high of about 100% of GDP in 2020. There is now also risk of severe economic scarring from job losses, bankruptcies, and the disruption of education. Because of this loss of capacity, we expect global output to remain well below our pre-pandemic projections over the medium term. For almost all countries, this will be a setback to the improvement of living standards. This crisis has also made inequality even worse because of its disproportionate impact on low-skilled workers, on women, on young people. They are clearly winners and they are clearly losers. And we risk ending up with a tale of two cities. We need to find a way out. So what is the path forward? We see four immediate priorities. First, defend people's health. Spending on treatment, testing, and contact tracing is an imperative. So too is a strong international cooperation to coordinate vaccine manufacturing and distributions once we have vaccines, especially in the poorest countries. Only by defeating the virus everywhere can we secure a full economic recovery anywhere. Second, avoid premature withdrawal of policy support. Where the pandemic persists, it is critical to maintain lifelines across the economy to firms and to workers, such as tax deferrals, credit guarantees, cash transfers, wage subsidies. Equally important is continued monetary accommodation and liquidity measures to ensure the flow of credit, especially to small and medium-sized firms, supporting jobs and supporting financial stability. Cut the lifelines too soon and the long ascent becomes a precipitous fall. Third, Flexible and forward-leaning fiscal policy will be critical for the recovery to take hold. This crisis has triggered profound structural transformation, and governments must play their role in reallocating capital and labor to support the transition. This will require both stimuli for job creation, especially in green investments, and cushioning the impact on workers, from retraining and reskilling to expanding the scope and duration of unemployment insurance. Safeguarding social spending will be critical for a just transition to new jobs. Fourth, deal with the debt, especially in low-income countries. They entered this crisis with already high debt levels. 
and this burden has only become heavier. If they are to fight the crisis and maintain vital policy support, if they are to prevent the reversal of development gains made over decades, they will need more help and they will need it fast. This means access to more grants, concessional credit, and debt relief, combined with better debt management and debt transparency. In some cases, global coordination to restructure sovereign debt will be necessary with full participation of public and private creditors. In all these areas, our member countries can count on the IMF. We will help them all the way up the mountain. We will strive to be their Sherpa. We will help show the way with sound policy advice. We will provide the training for the climb some may need. And above all, we will be there with financial support and we will help ease the debt burden for those who otherwise may not make it. We have provided financing at unprecedented speed and scale to 81 countries. We have reached over 280 billion in lending commitments, more than a third of that approved since March. And we are ready to do more. We'll still have substantial resources from our $1 trillion in total lending capacity to put it to the service of our members as they embark on their ascent. Again, this will be a difficult climb. It requires new paths up the mountain. We cannot afford simply to rebuild the old economy with its low growth, low productivity, high inequality, and worsening climate crisis. That is why we need fundamental reforms to build a more resilient economy, one that is greener, smarter, more inclusive, more dynamic. This is where we need to direct the massive investments that will be required for a strong and sustainable recovery. Our new research shows that increasing public investment by just 1% of GDP across advanced and emerging nations can create up to 33 million new jobs, badly needed. We know that in many cases, well-designed green projects can generate more employment and deliver higher returns compared with conventional fiscal stimulus. We also know that an accelerated digital transformation is underway. It is promising higher productivity and new jobs with higher wages. We can unlock this potential by retooling tax systems and investing in education and digital infrastructure. Our goal must be for everyone to have access to the internet and the skills to succeed in the 21st century economy. All this can be done. We know it from the previous generation that had the courage and the resolve to climb the mountains they faced. It is now our turn. This is our mountain. And as one climber put it, every mountain top is within reach if you just keep climbing. The same goes for the long ascent and the policies needed to move forward. Joined by a single rope, we can overcome the crisis and achieve a more prosperous and more resilient world for all. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Sarah Eisen. Thank you, Managing Director. Manoush, thank you to the LSE and, and to the IMF for having me and including me in this amazing event. It is quite a privilege to be able to moderate a conversation with two leaders and economists. And as someone who's covered the IMF and the World Bank for at least a decade, 
I can tell you they're both icons. So thank you. Madam Managing Director, I'll, I'll kick it off with you. As far as the economic outlook that, that you just gave, some might be surprised to hear that it was slightly optimistic, better than feared, I guess is, is, is my takeaway. How cloudy and uncertain is that though, given the fact that we are experiencing somewhat of a second wave in virus infections in Europe and potentially in the US, we are far from beating this thing. Uh, well, wonderful to be uh, with the two of you, and particularly uh, touching for me that it is the 125th anniversary of LSE. Uh, so, Sarah, let me start with the two words that define our projections. Less dire. Less dire <laughs> is not sunny. Uh, and why it is less dire? Because since we were hit by this crisis, two things happened. One, an incredibly powerful injection of liquidity by central banks and fiscal measures in a synchronized manner. They genuinely put this floor under the uh, uh, economy everywhere, and they have some spillover positive impact for some emerging markets that were in bigger trouble. Two, because we have been relatively good to learn how to function with the pandemic still around us. And we have seen measures uh, everywhere leading to a reopening. So when the spikes now happen, the restrictions are well targeted. They are not uniform. But let's be, let's be very uh, uh, clear. We have a, a extraordinary uncertainty about the longevity of the health crisis. Uh, and we also recognize that uh, while there is still fiscal space, there is still more to be done. It is not limitless. Uh, and uh, what we call on from the, uh, from the fund is to zero on what can help us go through this uncertainty uh, in the next uh, months, uh, uh, hopefully successfully coming on the other side, and also how to think about what is on the other side and act today to take advantage of this shock as an opportunity for transformation. We'll get into some of the policy solutions. And, and by the way, everyone who's listening, thank you for being here. And start thinking of your own questions, because we'll open it up in just a few moments. But Manoush, I wanted to turn it to you and ask you how it's going. You opened LSE. You, you have students back there, I believe, <laughs> right behind where you're sitting. How, how is that going? And how do you see that as a test case for the broader recovery and as we think about coming back? Mm. Well, I think I think uh, there's a lot of discussion about the shape of the recovery. You know, it's an alphabet soup. Is it going to be V-shaped, U-shaped, L-shaped? For me, the best description is it's going to be K-shaped. And we've just experienced the sharp drop. And now we're at a point where some sectors will benefit and some sectors will decline. And that's the K. I think taking off from where Kristalina uh, ended. And... The aspects of the economy that will do well are those parts of the digital economy. We're seeing manufacturing recover much more quickly than services, for example. And those sectors that have high levels of human contact, entertainment, hospitality, travel, tourism, et cetera, uh, are being hard hit. And we're in the middle of that restructuring of some sectors doing well and some sectors doing better. I think as Kristalina said, this is also a moment to accelerate productivity changes that were already in the works around the digital economy. We know already that digitization has been uneven. Some sectors of our economy like finance, for example, or telecommunications have digitalized rapidly. Others like healthcare or education have not. And in the case of education at the LSE, we're experimenting now with a blended model where lectures are online, but small classes and seminars are being held in person. And I think the future is going to be blended, a combination of sort of high tech and high touch 
these days high touch without with social distancing, of course. Uh, but I think that combination of maximizing digital potential, but also retaining that human element uh, is the future in many sectors. Managing director, I know the whole inequality and, and the fact that it's all been exacerbated by this crisis is top of mind for you, just how even it is. In so many cases, in so many countries, it's the low income workers, it's the frontline workers. Those are the ones that are suffering, in many cases, the health impact, but also the economic impact. How, how do you, how do we reach out to those who need the help the most economically? The um, story is uh, complicated by the fact that different countries find themselves in a different place. Uh, so uh, when, when we talk about uh, the alphabet soup, uh, some pull from the soup a uh, uh, L, and some pull from the, from the soup a V, and some pull from the soup a W, and that we have to uh, reflect uh, uh, carefully on. So let me answer uh, your question in uh, two parts. One, everywhere, universally, what we see is uh, low-skilled workers, those in the contact sectors, being severely hit. Women are on the losing part because they are more in these sectors, they are more in the informal economy, and of course, when we all stay at home, more of the uh, work at home falls on their shoulders. And on top of it, there is more domestic violence now with the crisis upon us. So when we think about the impact of the uh, crisis, uh, we have to be zeroing on policies that address exactly where the vulnerability is. Uh, and we have uh, seen countries coming up with smart policies to reduce inequality uh, through the uh, well-targeted uh, social uh, protection measures, through unemployment uh, uh, protection measures, through the uh, uh, identification of where the most vulnerable in society uh, are and how they can be best helped. Digitalization helps tremendously. We have seen some countries being very effective by using uh, digital platforms to direct social measures in a very effective uh, manner. My second part is to think about the uh, uh, shock that we have as a world in terms of poverty. After decades of poverty globally going down and down and down, for the first time, it is going up. And unless we get the economy to be stronger again, and unless we help the countries that are most severely impacted, we will see a reversal of what has been justifiably our pride as a world. Uh, and for that, institutions like mine have a big role uh, to play. I also wanted to zero in on, on what, what Kristalina said, Manoush, uh, in her speech about the impact on the youth, and particularly turn to you on what message you have there. On one hand, in many of these countries, young people are spreading this disease because they are more protected from a health perspective. But on the other hand, their lives are being disrupted in a major way and their livelihoods and their job prospects and, and education. So what, what's your message there to students and to the youth that are suffering? Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, this generation has, uh, has paid a high price, something like one and a half billion children missed out on their education in the last year. Uh, and you know, one of the things that surprised us at the LSE this year, we were unsure how many students would want to come given the crisis. And we were surprised on the upside. We got more students coming than we expected because what were their options? They couldn't travel, they couldn't get jobs, uh, and furthering their education was the best option they had for at this particular time. I think for young people today, they are entering an incredibly tough job market. Those who are 
just entering. Uh, and we know from the labor market research that if you enter a job market during a recession, during an economic crisis, that scarring lasts for decades. You will earn less for the rest of your life as a result of that. So I think we owe this generation quite a lot, actually. I think we owe them a lot for many reasons. One, because of this crisis. Two, because of the debt levels that we've accumulated that frankly, they will have to repay through future tax revenues, to, to tax payments. And three, because of the climate legacy that we've left them behind. And I think what we owe them is a huge investment in their education in order to improve their employment prospects in future, in order to improve the their ability to pay taxes in future, to repay these debts, and in order to support them in, uh, in transforming our, our economy into a greener one so that they can have a better environment to live in. I'm glad you brought up the debt issue, Managing Director. That's just where I wanted to go with you because so many countries are facing sky high debt loads and yet so many are also facing the need to do more, as you said, to do more stimulus and spend more to deal with the economy and the health crisis. How do you how do you balance those two, spending more, but also preventing a debt crisis? We are very clear in the message we are communicating: do not withdraw support prematurely. Why? Because uh, if we do so, then we risk massive bankruptcies and massive unemployment, uh, and that can be so tragic for the world economy uh, that uh, we have to do everything we can to prevent it. What is helping us? What is helping us are low interest rates, uh, in some cases, negative interest rates. Uh, and also we know that uh, it is very likely this would continue for quite some time. With the recovery being slow, the ascent being long, interest rates uh, have no pull to go up, but we have to recognize that in some countries, debt levels were high even before this crisis. And uh, when these are countries with weak economies, and especially when they are with economies more devastated by this crisis, either because they are dependent on tourism or, or on commodity exports, uh, uh, or because uh, they have very weak uh, fundamentals. When we are there, we should not wait. Uh, we have been very active with uh, President Malpass of the World Bank to call for debt service suspension. Great, the G20 embraced that. 43 countries, poor countries, were able to breathe because they didn't have to service uh, all their uh, debt. Uh, and the result is they can invest in their health systems. They can protect the most vulnerable people. This debt service suspension has to be continued because we are not seeing an exit from the crisis next year. We, and on our side at the fund, we have provided debt relief to our poorest members so they don't have to pay us until they, they see light in the end of this tunnel. So this is the first step to be taken. But for some countries, this is not going to be enough. Uh, we already have seen a uh, debt restructuring, Ecuador, Argentina. And what we are telling countries is don't wait. Do not wait so long that it becomes really, really painful. And the last uh, piece of advice, you would not be surprised coming from the IMF, is plan for your medium term fiscal framework so you actually know how you're going to deal with the debt uh, uh, down the road. As Minush said, we should not load this on the shoulders of the young generation. Uh, we should be thinking about tax reform. And in some countries, there is space uh, to do so. And practically everywhere, there is space to close down loopholes so revenues can go up to service the uh, debt uh, obligations. In, in the few minutes we have left, I, I wanna talk about, there's obviously a very long to-do list and, and you just outlined some very practical things that, are, that we can do now. Manoush, how do you think about what we can do to prevent this in the future so that we're better, we're better prepared to manage the health crisis, the economic fallout, the lockdowns, it all feels like we are just 
doing yeah. it on the fly and making it up as we go on? How do you deal with that well, then, question? It, about is, it is actually, we know what we need to do. We have to have a more resilient economy. Resilient people invest in education, in healthcare, in social protection. Resilient finances, make sure that you build buffers in good times. Those who have done it, they're going through the crisis with more ease. And resilient nature, make sure that we invest in low carbon, climate resilient, environmentally sustainable future. Putting all the right policies in place is best done in a crisis. We have seen it in the past, we ought to do it now. Manish? Well, I, I, I mean, I agree with that. I think, uh, I think this crisis, some people have called it COVID the great revealer because it revealed all of these vulnerabilities in our society, starting with our healthcare systems. Uh, you know, the WHO has a basic healthcare package that includes preventative uh, measures like vaccines, but also uh, things like uh, dealing with communicable diseases like COVID. It costs about 5% of GDP. Every country should be able to have that basic healthcare package as a minimum to make sure that these kinds of things don't happen in future. On top of that, this crisis reveals the vulnerability of many workers in our societies, those in the informal sector, those who had precarious work, women who were working in part-time informal type of jobs, young people. And just as the recent measures have put a floor on the world economy, in our own societies, we need to put a floor on people's incomes to make sure that nobody goes below a certain level. And some countries have done that. The cash transfer schemes that exist in many, many countries have been mobilized and that infrastructure to deliver cash to the poorest people in the world has been used effectively. Countries like India had a very good uh, you know, rural employment scheme to make sure that everyone was guaranteed 100 days of work. Uh, they extended that to cities now as a result of some research we did at the LSE uh, because COVID meant that unemployment in the cities was soaring. So all of those kinds of insurance mechanisms to make sure that in the context of a future crisis, people get some support. It's best to put in place before the crisis happens. At least we've done a bit of it of catching up during this crisis. And Sarah, finally, can I say yeah. one thing before we uh, leave this virtual room? After the uh, global financial crisis, what did we do? We built resilience in the financial system. We see the benefit of it. Now we have to expand that concept of resilience. Now we know better it is not good enough just to have the financial system uh, in good shape. So work to do and with a uh, global uh, consensus around what needs to be done, move forward. I just wanted to finally ask you, you know, we haven't even mentioned really the whole, the, the notion of a vaccine and development and just mm -hmm. how much ingenuity and resources are being, being yeah. thrown through the pharmaceutical sector globally. How much of a difference do you think the vaccine, before we go, will make for this entire thing, the outlook, the crisis, the inequalities, all the problems that we've just, just been discussing? Oh, big difference. And uh, this is where the upside can come. We have a vaccine, uh, it works, and then we have the smarts to apply it uh, everywhere. Uh, then, of course, we have durable exit from the, from the health crisis. Uh, and our uh, uh, projections for the future get much brighter. Uh, we also can have uh, a big advancement in uh, treatments. That helps. Again, my message would be, universally applied everywhere because only then we can have the uh, economy uh, to be on, uh, on a good uh, uh, footing. But let me say this, vaccines or no vaccines, we came in this crisis, how low productivity, low growth, high inequality. We have to exit in a better shape so then we are more resilient for, for future shocks to come. And believe you me, there will be future shocks. I just wanted to end it on a slightly optimistic note there before we open it up. And, and I think now we have a treat. We have two student questions and they are here live to ask you those questions directly. So, so I'll call on Celine Mano first. Hello, and thank you so much for the fascinating talk, Madam Director. My question is, 
A problem many central banks are currently facing is that interest rates are currently already near zero, leaving them with little room in which to maneuver. As a result, countries have been turning to more alternative policies. To what extent do you believe the negative interest rates can be successfully used by nations? And do you believe it would be appropriate in this crisis in light of its risks? Well, uh, thank you very much for this question. Uh, there is certainly in this environment value from interest rates being very low and in some cases even uh, negative because this is what allows abundant liquidity to be in place and this is what allows business continuity, employment continuity. But there are risk associated with low interest rates and especially with negative uh, interest rates. The first one is risk for savers. Long-term investment pension funds, they are finding it much more difficult in this low interest rate environment to guarantee uh, the income that is necessary, which takes us to the second risk, uh, that in, when interest rates are so low, there would be search for yield, perhaps with too much risk associated with it. And three, as, as you indicated in your question, we see the non-banking financial uh, system that is less regulated also becoming riskier. And it is very likely that more attention would be focused there. There is, however, link between how the economy is evolving and what happens with interest rates. Because we are in this low speed of recovery, interest rates just simply cannot get a boost to go up. And uh, uh, at the same time, we have to recognize that in some developing countries, interest rates are high, but they are high for the wrong reason because of the uh, risky uh, environment. Uh, so we, going back to what can we do, we have to concentrate on underpinning a recovery in which we pay much more attention on productivity, growth, and employment. And then we can think of getting out of this uh, uh, low risk, uh, uh, lo sorry, low, low interest rate uh, environment, which of course, for any economies, uh, is, uh, is a, a, a big anxiety to operate uh, uh, within. Our next question is from Musa Haraj, who is the International Development President at LSE. Go ahead, Musa. Hi. Hi, first of all, thank you so much to the panelists for their talk. It was really interesting to listen. Um, my question is for you, Madam Director. In terms of the bailouts the IMF does, for example, with countries like mine, example, Pakistan, they're incredibly painful to the population in the short term. You see price hikes in petrol, electricity, and the recent bailout they did, you know, the rupee lost half its value to this mass currency devaluations. So the question is, how does the IMF expect, uh, manage expectations of the population with the strong remedies which the economy needs? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, uh, putting this question. Uh, what we face today is a, an exogenous shock that hits countries everywhere, not because of failures of the countries, but because of this uh, self-induced stop of economic uh, activities. So producers don't produce, consumers don't, don't consume. And for that, we at the IMF uh, have adopted a very forward-leaning approach, which is to provide emergency uh, financing so we can help countries go through this period of uh, a very dramatic drop in economic activities. But in many places, this is not enough. Countries do need to improve their uh, economy so they are more resilient and more, more productive uh, for their own uh, people. And for this reason, we work with countries to have in place reforms that 
are on three pillars. One, how to get the economy uh, to be uh, uh, performing uh, in a way that creates more jobs. In other words, public investment in, and uh, private investment, good investment uh, climate for private investment uh, to take uh, place. Two, making sure that tax revenues uh, go up, that there is domestic resource mobilization. And in many countries, tax to GDP is very low and tax collection is very, very low. Countries do need to have these revenues. And three, governance, making sure that governments are accountable to their people. Now, these are not easy, easy reforms, especially when they are uh, in a context of sort of long period of time of half uh, measures. Uh, and I think we, we have to recognize that that for the, for the future of countries, these three elements, they have to be in place so countries do, uh, do well. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot avoid taking some measures that are difficult, but they are in the end necessary uh, for economic performance and ultimately for the well-being of people. This is questions coming in. So thank you all for submitting your questions. Uh, we have one here from, I think you like this, Matt, uh, Managing Director. From Marco Winter, who is an LSE student from Germany asks, what are the three most important leadership lessons you have learned during your career so far? <laughs> well, uh, thank you, uh, Marco. What I learned is first, brace for the unexpected. And when the unexpected expected happens, act decisively and, and make sure that people are together, that there is a resolve to take, to move forward, to do what is necessary and that when we do it together, it is actually exciting. And Marco, one thing that I also learned is that work has to be um, rewarding. It has to be exciting. It has to be also a little bit of fun. That's good. Uh, here's a question from Ali Sayani, an undergraduate student. And I think you'll like this one too. How is the IMF incorporating policies that are oriented toward improving sustainability and climate action in its member countries, especially for those countries who are suffering from environmental disasters alongside the coronavirus pandemic, such as Pakistan's floods? Is the IMF geared more toward long-term climate action or a more reactionary policy based on where disasters are more frequent? Good question. So the um, how we deal with the cri uh, climate crisis is macro critical. There is simply no way to sustain robust growth and improvement in living uh, standards if we don't deal with uh, the climate crisis, if we don't reduce carbon emissions and we don't adapt to climate shocks. What the IMF does is we walk on two uh, feet. <laughs> One, we work very hard to help countries put in place climate mitigation policies that combine investment in low carbon uh, transformation, putting a price on carbon with predictability for what this price is going to be over time as an incentive to, uh, to change, and making sure that there is support for workers and sectors that, are, that have to transform. In other words, that there is a just transition to low carbon economy. And two, we work with especially highly vulnerable countries to do climate assessments that help them identify where their vulnerabilities are and how they can best deal with it. And you wouldn't be surprised, we concentrate on, on countries that, that are already being hammered by climate shocks. Like, uh, like the Caribbean uh, 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 countries, uh, like uh, countries with uh, high, high, high uh, risks of floods and, and droughts, the Sahel, or you mentioned Pakistan, 
uh, uh, countries in South Asia. And that is longer term vision that the IMF is embracing that some are still surprised uh, we, to see us working uh, on. Don't be surprised. The future has to be financially sound, but for that reason, it has to be environmentally and socially sustainable. Um, Manoush, here's one I think that, that might be good for you. Uh, I just lost it. Sorry. Um, it's about the post-crisis economy uh, and, and basically how you think it's going to look. One student is asking here if you think it's going to look like a post-war economy and which, which countries are going to suffer the worst and what are going to be some of the more permanent damage that we're looking at across the global economy. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a little early to answer that question. I think we don't know what the shape of the future world economy is going to be. I think we are going through a period of a sort of wave of deglobalization. Uh, many, uh, many companies and countries are looking at retrenching their supply chains closer to home. And so I think that will result in a significant change in global trade. Uh, global capital flows have also retrenched, and it will be a question as to whether they go back to the levels that we saw uh, in kind of peak globalization. And I have no doubt that the flow of people around the world will not recover quickly, uh, and we won't see the kind of mobility of people uh, around the world uh, that we've seen in recent years. I think what's the big unknown is what will the new equilibrium level be? Uh, and I don't think it will be what it used to be. It will probably be less, but the question is how much, how much less. Uh, and I think helping countries navigate that, that transformation will be a key role for, for the IMF and for policymakers around the world to find that new equilibrium. Uh, many good questions coming in here for, for managing director from, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Theodore Nomov, who is an LSE student from Bulgaria. Uh, asking, it is amazing that the IMF is ready to support so many countries, but many of those countries face a lot of political challenges. So how is the IMF going to ensure the support is effective and not lost through corruption or other political difficulties that are experienced by countries? Great question. When we provide even emergency financing, it doesn't mean that we are blindfolded. We have uh, very few requirements but there is zero exactly on this question. How do we make sure that money is uh, well spent? So first, what we do is we assess the institutions through which the money, is, the money would go. Do they have appropriate safeguards? Are they transparent? And then two, we are asking countries uh, in emergency financing, concentrate on your health workers and your health systems, protect the most vulnerable. Spend the money, but keep the receipts. And it is the receipt that we audit to make sure that money is really uh, well spent. And I can tell you, uh, there have been uh, cases when um, it has been much more difficult to come up with, uh, with the uh, support. Uh, we still have a, uh, a couple of countries for different reasons. One of the reasons being uh, we cannot quite ascer ascertain this safety of application of the money when uh, we are yet to, to, to take to our board uh, uh, proposals for financing. Accountability to the citizens in this crisis is absolutely critical. Last question is for both speakers. Um, it comes from Emma Lakonen, from, an LSE student from Helsinki. Um, and I'll start with you, Manoush. She asks, in your view, how does the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic resemble the previous economic crises of the world that we've seen? And how does it differ from them? Mm. It's, it's interesting. I think after, um, I often think about, you know, crises are moments for opportunities for change. Uh, and there are some crises where the world was transformed after them. So you think about the Great Depression or World War II, there were fundamental reorderings of our society after those two huge economic shocks. World War I, 
not much changed afterwards. And in fact, the fact that not much changed laid the seeds and the foundations for World War II. And I think the 2008 financial crisis, if you think about it, we did a lot to make the financial system more safe, but many of the other issues that we were facing, we never addressed. The issues around inequality, the issues around the future of work, all of those issues were not addressed in 2008. And in many ways, we're suffering the consequences of that. So I think, you know, echoing a little bit how Kristalina ended her speech, let's make this crisis worth it. <laughs> let's make sure that we take this opportunity to fundamentally reorder our societies to solve some of these problems uh, in, a way that, in a way that's lasting. Mm. Managing Director, I'll give you the final word on this one. Uh, well, the, uh, the most dramatic uh, difference in this crisis than, say, the global financial crisis is the um, human suffering, the loss of lives, and uh, the uh, tremendous uh, uh, emotional impact it has on all of us. Mm -hmm. um, we ought to be thinking, what is the best memorial we can build for people who lost their lives? And it is to make the world more resilient to these uh, kinds of uh, shocks. One positive thing of any shock of that nature is that it does make us more sober. We re-evaluate what really matters in, in life. Uh, let's not allow this to disappear. Turn it into positive uh, energy for change. Uh, and change has to be on these grounds. How we can withstand future shocks, especially climate shocks, how we can make our economies, our societies more inclusive so we don't have people left out or left behind, uh, how we make it so that the tax systems we have are for the 21st century, century that the parts of the economy that are growing are helping society to be more vibrant and resilient and that we are, as a world, in a position of strength that builds our unity rather than uh, fragments us. Uh, I'm hopeful, I'm actually uh, an optimist. I believe that uh, we can come on the other side as a more resilient, strong, stronger world. It's a perfect way to leave the conversation. Thank you both so much. And thank you all for, to, for all the students and the alum for sending such great questions. Manoush, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. I think my, my role is over. Well, thank, thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for doing such a great <laughs> job in moderating this global event. Uh, and thank you, Kristalina, for joining us and launching the celebration of LSE's 125th birthday. We're really grateful to you for doing that. And even more importantly, thank you for being a Sherpa to the countries of the world and helping them navigate the long ascent. Uh, and I have complete confidence that with you uh, leading the way and you and all of your wonderful colleagues at the IMF, uh, we, will, we will get to the top of this mountain. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us. <laughs>